Google just released Gemma Two, the second iteration of their open weight models. In this family contains three models including two, nine and twenty seven billion versions, but Google is only releasing the bigger two models at the moment. Now on benchmarks, this seems to be best in class where the nine billion version is able to outperform Llama three eight billion and the twenty seven billion version is very close to the seventy billion version of Llama 3 on academic benchmarks. Now personally, I'm not a big fan of academic benchmarks, but uh, Google has been testing this model on LMSS Chatbot Arena for a while under uh, a pseudonym. And this seems to be doing pretty good. In the overall ranking, this is sitting at number 11, and I'm talking about the bigger 27 billion version, which is right below Gemini 1.5 Flash. And the uh, scores are pretty close, which is pretty impressive for a model of its size. The Lama 3 uh, 70 billion instruct is at number 12. Lama 3 70 billion is at number 12, while uh, the smaller Gemini 2 is at number 9. Now, there is probably a reason why it's doing really good on the LMSense benchmark when people are using these models. That will become clear when we look at the technical report. Google also released a highly detailed technical report titled Gemma 2 Improving Open Language Models at a Practical Size. It's a lot more detailed compared to some of the other technical reports that we have seen. And a section on knowledge distillation of training the smaller models is very interesting. Now, I read the technical report but wanted Claude 3.5 Sonnet to help me with some understanding. So I provided that and said, create a mind map of the paper. So here's the mind map that it came up with. It talks about introduction. So it's a lightweight, state-of-the-art, open-weight models, which ranges from two to 27 billion parameters. It also talks about the architecture. So it's a pretty good summary of the main points. It's a decoder-only transformer. And there are some innovations that they have introduced when it comes to the architecture. But for me, I was really interested in the training data. So there are three different data sets of varying size that are used to train different models, which is pretty interesting to see. And they use this approach called knowledge distillation for the smaller models, which could really become a defective way of training smaller models from bigger models if these results hold true. And we're going to spend quite some time understanding how knowledge distillation from a bigger model to a smaller model works. Now, they have the same tokenizer, which they use for the, the first uh, series of Gemma and Gemini model, that has a pretty high vocabulary size of 256,000 tokens. And that's why it's pretty good, potentially, at multilingual tasks, although it's specifically trained on English language. Now, when it comes to training, they are doing pre-training and then supervised fine-tuning with behavioral cloning that will become evident when we talk about knowledge distillation and they used a policy for RLHF along with merging multiple different iterations of the models to see whether that improves the performance. So there are a lot of details we are going to look at some of the stuff in, in this uh, video so it's going to be very different than my normal videos. One thing which I'm going to highlight is the way they have used the LMSS training data or the LMSS prompts in the training that could have an impact on why these models are able to perform better on the LMSS Arena chatbot leaderboard. Okay, so one of the major issues with training these large language models is that even the smaller models require a lot of data to fine tune them. So for example, the Lama 3 family is fine tuned up to 15 trillion tokens, which is pretty huge uh, depending on it gives only less than 1% improvement compared to the state-of-the-art models, which I think in that case they're talking about the Mistral family. Now, even with this huge amount of data, there is evidence that shows that these models are still under-trained. So there has to be a better way of training these models if you don't really have access to a lot of data. Now, that's where this knowledge distillation from a bigger model to a smaller model comes in. So you have a teacher model and you use the probability distribution of the teacher model to train your student model. And they have adopted that methodology for the smaller 9 and 2 billion parameter models. And they do pretty good. Now for the 27 billion model, they 
basically train this model from scratch so not they're not doing any knowledge destination okay so i've been talking about about knowledge destination so let's understand what exactly this is and how it works so the normal way of training these models is to to use them as next word prediction models so it's a single architecture which predicts the next uh, token now the way it works is you have your uh, language model and a sequence comes in so for example as sequence is the quick brown fox and the model has to make a prediction uh, for the next token based on its training data what it has seen there is a distribution of tokens probabilities so for example in this case jumps has the higher probability to be the next word right so the model picks that word with the highest probability make that as a predicted token and then compares it with the ground truth or what in reality is supposed to be the token that is supposed to predict right so you have the predicted token the ground truth token and then you calculate the loss that loss is used to update the model weights right so that's how we do pre-training of these large language models but uh, there's another way so you instead of one model you can use two different models in this case you have a teacher model which is a much bigger model something like gpt4 or gemini 1.5 pro or even uh, cloud sonnet and then you have the student model that's the model that you want to fine tune or train right now in this case what you do is you take your uh, sequence you pass it through the teacher model the teacher model will it's use its um, token distribution or the probabilities that it has to pick the next most probable token right then you uh, do the same thing by looking at the probability distribution of the student model but rather than computing the loss function for the student model based on its prediction what you want to do is you want to use KL divergence and the way KL divergence work is it compares the distributions uh, from two different let's say models so you want the probability distribution of student model to be very close to the teacher model right and you update the model weights based on the KL divergence. Now to understand KL divergence, here's a quick example. So for example, here the KL divergence of the teacher model. So this is the probability distribution that you want to adopt. And here's the uh, probability distribution for next token of the student model. Now, if you simply change the probability distribution of the student model to get closer to the uh, distribution of uh, teacher model, so the teacher distribution, you will reduce the KL divergence and during the training process this is your objective so you will keep changing the weights of the student model in a way that it will try to adopt the distribution that it's seeing from the teacher model now the good thing about this is that indirectly you can distill knowledge from this bigger teacher model to the uh, smaller student model and that's the technique that Google is using for the Gemma 2 models. Now, interestingly enough, uh, they do this both during pre-training as well as the fine-tuning stage uh, when it comes to the smaller models. Uh, now, this is a way in which you can really improve the performance of these models without needing trillions and trillions of tokens. Now, I suspect that they're using the 27 billion model probably as a teacher model or maybe even using the bigger Gemini models. But I think that detail is not present in the paper. So in terms of the training processes, very similar for all the models, you have the supervised, you have pro plus pre-training, then supervised fine tuning. Then on top of it, they have a policy model which does reinforcement learning from human feedback. And then they are doing model merging. So they basically train multiple uh, versions of the models and then merge their weights together by averaging uh, the model weights and on top of that they have a safety layer which basically filter information based on whether it's unsafe outputs or there are duplicates so here's how the prompt template looks like so if you are to use this model you want to make sure that this is the prompt template you follow this is for a single turn conversation so you have special tokens then the role is user then end of the turn, then you use the same tokens as the beginning of, and you have the model rule, then end of the tokens, and you put end of the sequence. So if you were to use it for a second turn, so this is basically, you will just append that. So you need to make sure that there is this end of sequence token that will indicate the end of the conversation. So in the beginning of the video, we said that Gemini 2 
seems to be doing really well on chatbot arena and this might be explained with the help of what they have used for training so in the post training they talk about the data set that they used so they say we extended the training the post training data from Gemini 1.5 with a mixture of internal and external public data in particular we use the prompts but not the answers from Adam says chat 1 million and all of our data go through the filter process now keep in mind they took the prompts that are available on LMS's chart and used those as inputs in their training process, but they didn't use the responses. Since they used that data during the supervised fine tuning process, so I assume that the teacher model was used to generate responses for those prompts which are in the LMS's chart data set. Now, the benefit of this approach is that it will avoid biases from predetermined responses and encourage the model of creativity and flexibility. Since we are using the teacher model to generate responses for those inputs that are in the LMSYS chart data set, and we, they are doing RLHF, so there is a tendency that the model might adopt to, especially like the teacher model might adopt to responses which are going to be favored by human annotators. And we are doing knowledge distillation on top of it. So uh, during the knowledge distillation process, the student model will basically clone the behavior of the teacher model, right? So it will start generating responses very similar to the uh, teacher model, especially if you run it for uh, a lot longer with a lot of details, right? And as a result, that it probably is going to learn how to answer these prompts that are present in the chatbot arena. And that could potentially explain why the responses from even a smaller models are liked more compared to the other open weight models. Now that's pure speculation on my part. It may or may not be actually happening, but this is something that I think will require a lot more experimentations. Now they also did ablation studies, which is very important, especially they were trying to compare uh, models which are trained from scratch versus which are trained using this knowledge distillation process. And this seems to show that for the smaller models, so for example, the 2.6 uh, billion token, when it's trained from scratch on benchmarks, it's all only able to get up to 60, which is the average score. But with knowledge destination process, it is able to get to 67.8, which is a substantial improvement. So if this holds true, it could be a way of actually training smaller models. And not only that it improves the uh, score and benchmarks, but even the perplexity of uh, models that are distilled from bigger models is much better compared to the models that are trained from scratch. So that's one very important, I think, finding. The second one is changing sliding window size, right? So they show that even if you uh, keep changing the sliding window size, the effect on perplexity is minimal, right? This means that during inference time, you can change the sliding window size, you can get much better inference speed with a minimal reduction in performance. So this is going to be huge if, it, if these results actually hold true. If you want to use this model, the easiest way is to use in Google AI Studio. So under the models, now you have Gemma 2. You can interact with the model here. It's also available on Hugging Face, so the weights are available both for the 9 billion and 27 billion version, and I believe even the quantized versions are available now. So I'll create a subsequent video in, where, in which we're going to test the model. I'll show you how to integrate it with your own code basis. Now, if that's something you're interested in, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Uh, thanks for watching, and as always, see you in the next one.